Friends, welcome back to the Wild at Heart podcast here in the week of May 30th. We have an announcement. Yeah, some really exciting news. We are on the precipice of something I think listeners are going to be just blown away by. We're really, really stoked. Next week, my new book, Resilient, launches into the world. And we feel very, very deeply, very strongly from the Spirit of God that this message is for this moment. Absolutely. And what we want to do is something special instead of just talk about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can talk about a gift or you can give the gift. We're just going to play chapter one this week. We want to introduce you to the to the content and over the next several weeks, share with you some of the precious, precious gifts in this book. So here we go. Okay. Before we start chapter one, I want to tell you a story. I've entitled it Living Water. In 1946, Wilfred Thesiger made an impossible trek across the desolate, empty quarter of Arabia with four Bedouins, journeying in winter on camelback. But they reached a desperate point in their odyssey when the odds looked really grim. They were nearly out of water. The next well was beyond an impassable mountain range of dunes, and their camels were showing signs of collapsing. Here's what he wrote in his journal. All the skins were sweating, and we were worried about our water. There had been a regular and ominous drip from them throughout the day, a drop falling to the sand as we rode along like blood dripping from a wound that could not be staunched. I suppose I was weak from hunger, for the food which we ate was a starvation ration even by Bedouin standards, but my thirst troubled me most. I was always conscious of it. Even when I was asleep, I dreamt of racing streams of ice-cold water, but it was difficult to get to sleep. I worried about the water which I had watched dripping away onto the sand and about the state of our camels. The survivor's first need is water. You can live 40 days without food, but only three without water. Water is life. Finding water is one of your first objectives. Chapter 1. I just want life to be good again. Restore the sparkle to my eyes, Psalm 13.3. The longing for things to be good again is one of the deepest yearnings of the human heart. It has slumbered in the depths of our souls ever since we lost our true home. For our hearts remember Eden. Now, most of the time, this beautiful, powerful longing flows like an underground river below the surface of our awareness, so long as we are consoled by some measure of goodness in our lives, while we're enjoying our work, our family, our adventures, or the little pleasures of this world, the longing for things to be good again seems to be placated. But when trials and heartbreaks wash in, the longing rises to the surface like a whale coming up for air filled with momentum and force. This is especially true after times of severe testing, because during the testing, we are rallying. But when the storm subsides, the longing for things to be good again rises up to demand relief. How we shepherd this longing, so crucial to our identity and the true life of our heart, how we listen to it, but also guide it in right or wrong directions, this determines our fate. The drive that propels us. You see, God has given each human soul a capacity and drive, a primal aspiration for life. This is as fundamental to you as your own survival. The epicenter of our being is the deep longing to aspire for things that bring us life, to plan for those things, to take hold of them, to enjoy them, and then start the cycle over 
as we aspire towards new things. This is the essential craving for life given to us by God. Let's call this capacity the primal drive for life. The longing for things to be good again, that's the mournful cry of the primal drive for life in us, like the haunting cries of whales under the sea. As George Eliot wrote, it seems to me we can never give up longing and wishing while we are thoroughly alive. There are certain things we feel to be beautiful and good, and we must hunger after them. This hunger allows human beings to survive the most terrible ordeals. It also enables us to savor all the goodness of the world, to love, and to create works of immense beauty. I've long enjoyed St. John of the Cross's poetry about the soul's intimacy with God. So I was shocked and appalled to discover that this dear man was, at one point in his life, unjustly imprisoned and tortured. As Daniel Ladinsky wrote, in 1577, as a result of the attempted reform of the Carmelite order and his alliance with St. Teresa of Avia, he was kidnapped and imprisoned at Toledo. For much of the nine months St. John was in prison, he was confined to a tiny cell, actually an unlit closet, in which he could not even stand up. He was left to relieve himself on the floor of this tiny cell, and his few scraps of food and water were sometimes thrown into his feces and urine. On a regular basis, he was brought from his cell in order to be beaten to the extent that he became permanently crippled. He was not given a change of clothes or allowed to wash for months. He became infested with lice and dysentery. He was forced to sleep upon his own excrement. But it was during this period of debased confinement and torture that he miraculously composed some of his greatest poetry. St. John prevailed and brought enormous beauty to the world from his ordeals. His primal drive for life was imbued by God with a supernatural resilience. And let me make a little observation here. Friends, we are in pursuit of resilience, of strength, of well-being. And one of the secrets is that true resilience is something that is imparted to us by the life of God within us, just as you heard was true in the life of St. John of the Cross. So very thirsty. Our primal drive for life has taken a real beating over the past few years. It isn't only the pandemic. We were all running like rats on a wheel before 2020 addicted to technology, overwhelmed by global news, wrung out from social tensions, exhausted body and soul from the madness of modern life. Does anybody even remember? Life was draining, folks. It wasn't like we stepped out of a three-year sabbatical when we stepped into 2020. We were set up to be steamrolled by the pandemic. Then came the repeated cycles of fear, control, chronic disappointment, all those losses, great and small, the inability to make plans for the future. This throttled our capacity for living. Just as serial rejection harms our ability for relationship or chronic failure cripples our capacity for hope, and so we started reaching for relief. Stacy and I were among the 62 million homeowners who did renovations during the pandemic. That's more than three quarters of all homeowners in the U.S., the highest levels ever seen. We painted the living room. We got some new carpet, a couple new chairs. We upgraded the garden as well. Now, folks, this was far more than boredom or the desire for change. It was a profound longing for a fresh start at life in the midst of so much loss and uncertainty. The renovation craze reflected something far deeper, a yearning for life to be good again, expressed in paint and carpet, gardens and landscaping. 
But the whole time Stacy and I were renovating our home, I could feel something was off. The preoccupation of making our home look nicer took my mind off the death count in New York, London, Paris, and Delhi. The vicious acrimony over vaccines. But it didn't feel like the answer. It was good. I enjoyed it. But it didn't bring about the fix I was longing for. And speaking of fixing things, this is fascinating. I noticed through the first half of 2021 that I was doing all sorts of obsessive fixing. Everything from a dripping faucet to a lamp that had been wobbly for years. They each seized my attention and I had to set it right. My soul was desperate to set things right. Haven't you felt this too? Aren't you beginning to see the connection? Okay, but then life began to return to some semblance of normal, right? We got restaurants back, movies, travel, outdoor concerts. The world rushed out like the starving survivor of a shipwreck, brought back from isolation and set before a Sunday brunch. (laughs) In the summer of 2021, you couldn't get a rental car, Airbnb, or campsite. Airports, beaches, national parks were jammed. I was up in the mountains of Colorado in very remote trailheads trying to get, yeah, a little bit of life back. I couldn't find a parking place. It was like spring break in Miami. The longing for things to be good again was and still is raging. And personally, I couldn't get enough. But all those comforts and activities weren't delivering whatever it was my soul was desperately longing for. That won't work. One of the most remarkable things about human beings is how resilient we can be. The primal drive for life can accomplish impressive things. St. John took his suffering and brought forth beauty. Nelson Mandela survived 27 years of imprisonment and brought forth forgiveness. And yet, one of the most surprising things about human beings is how all that resilience can evaporate in a moment. One day, the resources we have to sustain the primal drive for life simply run out. The mother, who for decades pours and pours into her family, and then one day up and has an affair with her best friend's husband. The minister, who for decades served up banquets from the word of God, suddenly decides he doesn't believe in Jesus anymore. It has to do with reserves. You see, we tap into our deep reserves to endure years of suffering and deprivation. And then one day, our heart simply says, I don't care anymore. I'm done. We abandon the fight and go off to find relief. I think this is what's happening now on a global scale. You see, human beings are at the same time both resilient and unpredictably fragile, like camels. A better test for how vulnerable we may actually be is to check on our reserves. For we can rally, and we have rallied. Way to go, everybody. Way to go. You did. But every time you rally, you tap into your reserves. And though you might feel like you're doing pretty well on any given day, you're still burning through precious resources and your reserve tank is precariously low, like the drip, drip, dripping of the water bags of Wilfred Thysiger's party way out in the middle of the desert. This is the trauma cycle. We rally in the face of harm, and when the harm subsides, we live in denial of it and go off in search of some taste of Eden. When our efforts are thwarted, things like rage and despair surface, which are common to trauma responses. This is why rallying can actually be deceptive. Reserves tell the true story. So during the early stages of the pandemic, I circled up my little staff of 18 wonderful saints, all working online, right? Everybody's working online. I wanted to check on their well-being. So I asked them some questions about resilience. How is your operating strength these days? If you're normally functioning at 100%, what are you functioning at now? Their answers hovered around 30%. 
Most days, they were feeling about 30% of their normal strength. This is what trauma does. Now, tell me about your reserves. If a major crisis were to hit tomorrow, what sort of reserves do you have available? Their answers averaged about 15%. And this is a very resilient and mature group of people. Okay, so I asked them the same questions one year later, late in 2021. Though things had somewhat improved, they were not reporting soaring scores. And so I want to ask you, how about your own reserves? Have you even assessed them? Allow me to ask you a couple of questions. If another pandemic were to sweep across the globe next week, some brand new deadly threat, and we all found ourselves back to quarantines, living under the vague threat of suffering and death, living in a state of constant uncertainty about the future, with no clear finish line? How does your heart respond to that? Or what if the economy collapses? What if by the time you're hearing this audiobook, the impending recessions and supply shortages and all that stuff, what if the economy reels, breaks, fractures? Do you have the reserves to handle years of that? Or try this on. Your house or apartment is going to burn down tomorrow. And though everyone will survive, you'll lose everything else. All your belongings, your records, valuable documents, precious family keepsakes, all of it. You will need to rebuild your entire life. Do you have 100% Vim and Verve for that scenario? Like I said, we've not yet paid the psychological bill for the COVID-19 pandemic. We tap deep into our reserves to rally, and we are in no condition to face more trauma let alone the assaults of our enemy. Trauma sensitizes you to more trauma and brings to the surface past trauma. You don't get used to it. Each new crisis simply piles on the stress. Okay, so here's a fascinating thing. In my world of therapists and counselor friends, both in the U.S. and overseas, I do not know a single therapist that has an opening right now. And not only that, their wait lists are four months, six months, eight months. I've read some articles saying that that's pretty widely true across the board. So, you know, everybody rallied, everybody came through, we did our best, educated your kids at home, you worked from the kitchen table on Zoom, all that stuff, or you didn't have work. And now when things seem to be maybe getting back to some semblance of normalcy, and thank God for all the goodness that is back, the problem is is that now the soul is demanding care. And recent trauma surfaces past trauma. Okay, so each new crisis simply piles on the stress. The treacherous thing about human nature is that the primal drive for life is so compelling, we will sacrifice almost anything for it our health, marriages, careers, even our faith. After a time of global trauma and deprivation, the longing rages, so we wander off in search for life. But reckless wandering without a clear plan or destination often adds to our suffering rather than bringing relief. I was reading the story about when John Wesley Powell made the first descent of the Colorado River, which was uncharted at the time. Through the Grand Canyon in 1869, he and his colleagues had no idea what kind of test was in store for them. Wild rapids, unexpected falls, swirling pools that threatened to devour their wooden boats. They didn't have, you know, rubber whitewater rafts and whitewater rafting gear, okay? After weeks of this, several of the crew mutinied. Against all warnings, they left the river and tried to find an exit out of the canyon through Apache lands. And those men were never heard from again. I fear we're being lured into similar dangers as we grasp for relief from all that we have endured. Not just through the pandemic, you see, but all that you have endured in the story of your life. Return to me. 
The exodus of the people of Israel and their journey through the Sinai Desert is one of the greatest survival stories of all time. More than two million people wandering through a land of sand and barren rock, homeless, looking for the land of abundance, a place to call home. When will life be good again? There were no real sources of food in that desert. Water was about as scarce as it is on the surface of the moon. A barren wilderness, Jeremiah described it. A land of deserts and pits. A land of drought and death where no one lives or even travels. Okay, so this is more than a moment in Jewish history. It is recorded for us as one of the great analogies of human experience. Our journey from bondage to freedom, from barrenness to the promised land. Ultimately, it is the precursor to our journey of salvation from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God. It is a story about the primal drive for life. Where will we take our thirst? This is the choice, the test. Always has been, always will be. This primal drive for life was so compelling, it caused thousands of those rescued slaves to mount a rebellion to go back to bondage in Egypt just so they could have their familiar ways back. I just want my normal life back. <laughs> like That is seriously sobering. In fact, Jeremiah says, the heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. The great alarm the scriptures are sounding is that our longing for life to be good again will be the battleground for our heart. How you shepherd this precious longing, and if you shepherd it at all, will determine your fate in this life and in the life to come. This is playing out in a post-pandemic world. We only sort of want God. What we really want is for life to be good again. If God seems to be helping, awesome. We believe. If he doesn't, well, that's where the crisis of heart is taking place right now. That's where many, many people are either saying, yeah, you know, God, all that. I'll get back to that later. Or just walking away, period, from their faith, feeling betrayed and abandoned by God. So this is the first stage of the coming storm that I'm talking about. We've all run off to find life and joy following years of stress, trauma, and deprivation. Okay, totally understandable, but it isn't working. It won't ever work. We return to our normal Monday through Friday disappointed. And disappointment soon becomes disillusionment. And disillusionment makes us extremely vulnerable to our enemy. We must lovingly shepherd our famished thirst back to the source of life. The river of life. My longtime friend and publisher, Brian Hampton, used to tell me, put the cookies on the bottom shelf. By which he meant, don't make folks wait until the end of the book to get the help you're offering. Fair enough. Let me give you something right now that will prove enormously helpful. And your appreciation for it will grow as we go on, I promise. When the human heart and soul experiences month after month of disappointment and loss, death rolls in. Dr. Richard Gunderman described the progressive onset of disillusionment as the accumulation of hundreds or thousands of tiny disappointments, each one hardly noticeable on its own. These disappointments and the loss of hope and dreams suffocates the primal drive for life. But God has provision for us. Now, I know, I know. Most of you think that what you need right now is three months off at the coast. 
walking on the beach, drinks on the deck, and with all my heart, I hope you find that. But for most of us, a sabbatical in some gorgeous refuge is probably not available. What is available is the river of life, God himself, in ways that we have not yet tapped into. God wants to make his life available to you. Remember, he's the creator of those beautiful places you wish you could go right now and take a sabbatical. All that beauty and resilience, all that life comes from God. And he wants to impart a greater measure of himself to you. The life of God is described in scripture as a river, a powerful, gorgeous, unceasing, ever-renewing, ever-flowing river. Ezekiel was given a number of beautiful visions, glimpses into the kingdom of God that permeates this world. He saw the temple of God in Jerusalem, and out of the temple was flowing the river of life. As it flowed forth across the countryside, it became so deep and wide, it wasn't possible to swim across it an image of abundance. I love how the passage ends. Where the river flows, everything will live. That's Ezekiel 47, 9. Everything will live. This is what we want, to live, to find life in its fullness again. The apostle John was given a revelation of the coming kingdom and the restored earth, and he saw the river of life flowing right down the middle of the city of God. And then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. That's Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. There is so much life flowing from God that it flows like a mighty river. Isn't that marvelous? Okay, follow me now. The river of life is not just for later. Jesus stated clearly that the river is meant to flow out of our inner being right here, right now, in this life. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink, he said. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. John 7, 37 and 38. The mighty life of God flowing in you and through you, saturating you like a river. Okay, so let me pull all this together. We have a capacity and drive in us for living. It's a precious longing, and it's taken a beating. God is the fountain of life. There is so much life flowing from God that it flows like a river no one can even swim across, a superabundant outflow of life. And this life is meant to flow in us and through us. Okay, so at the end of each chapter, what we're going to do is shift gears for a moment. These sections are entitled Skill, and this one is Receiving the River of Life. And what we're able to do is to tap into the presence of God and the river of life through prayer. So you know, if you're driving along in your car right now, you, you'll be fine. You can You can pray through this. Just don't close your eyes. (laughs) If you're in a busy place that's kind of noisy and crowded right now, you might want to pause and get into a quiet place where you can have just a few moments to really enter into this. I mean, if if your house is chaotic right now, like go into the bathroom or into the closet and shut the door. That's what I would do. Okay. So what I want to do is guide you into a very simple prayer and an encounter. In order to tap into the river of life, we begin by loving God 
in our longing for life to be good again. That's where things are decided, in this precious longing. Now, nearly all of us have been chasing relief in a myriad of hopes, plans, dreams, without first really turning to God. So, what we need to do is enter this longing, feel it, become present to it, and in that place, start loving God. Okay, we choose Him. Our first step towards resilience is to return our primal drive for life and our longing for things to be good again to God. We come back to Jesus from all the other places we've been chasing life. We allow him to be our rescuer right here in the longing for life to be good again. And we ask God to fill us with the river of life. Okay. So let's settle into this and pray. Jesus. Jesus. I come back to you now in my longing for life to be good again. And and folks, just begin to locate that longing. Kind of settle into this and go, yeah, where is that longing in me for life? It might be in the hope of a vacation right now. It might be that life is wonderful and the longing is expressed in your hope that it doesn't end, doesn't stop being good. Just settle in. Find that longing. Jesus, I come back to you now in my longing for life to be good again. And I love you here, Lord, in my soul's heartache. I consecrate to you my primal drive for life. I consecrate it to you. I surrender to you my ability to aspire for good things, to plan for them, to take hold of them, to enjoy them, and to keep on aspiring. I consecrate all living in me to you, Lord Jesus. I give you my famished craving for life to be good again. And I love you right here in this place within me. Just linger there for a moment. I love you, God, right here in the ache, in the search, and in the drive for life in me. I love you here, Lord. I love you right here. And Jesus, I need to ask your forgiveness for running to all these other places, hoping that it will fill my heart's need for Eden and for life to be wonderful. I'm coming back to you now as best I can, without perfection, without performance, just as best I can in this moment, I give you my famished craving for life. And I love you right here. I turn to you here. And now I ask that the river of your life would flow in me, in my primal drive for life and in my longing for life to be good again. I open my heart and soul to the river of life. Let it flow in me, through me, all around me, restoring, renewing, healing me. Okay, just stay with that. Pray that. I open my heart and soul to the river of life. Let it flow in me, through me, all around me restoring, cleansing, renewing, and healing me. Lord, you alone are the life I seek, and I welcome your river into my heart and soul. I receive the river of your life in me, Lord. Just receive it right now. Thank you. Thank you, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. 
Okay, so we're going to explore a number of what I call supernatural graces as we move through the book. And I think it will help your faith to know that your experience of these will be very gentle. Though we call them supernatural graces, that doesn't mean they come like an earthquake or a lightning strike. God is tender with our weary souls. He doesn't overwhelm us with his presence. As we practice these graces, their strength does grow. But your initial experience of them will be very gentle, and this will help you trust what you're experiencing. So give this simple prayer that we just did, praying into asking for the river of life. Give this a try for one week. I think you'll see. Wow. We have been doing this prayer, this experience, this skill as a team, praying the river of life, and it's been so good. And John, I love how in the book on audio, there's also music with it. There's a chance, whether you read it or listen to it, there's just, you're taking us deeper by not just talking about concepts, yes, but bringing us into the actual skills of practicing. Yes, it. yes. I think we are in a moment where the human soul needs great care, and the care comes from God, mm. and it comes from all of this life flowing through our humanity, restoring us, renewing us. So that is why... We are so excited for this book to come out. I mean, this it's like when Wild at Heart came out. We knew, hey, we're, we're onto something significant here. Or when right. Beautiful Outlaw or All Things New, they just felt like messages for the moment. Yes. So, gang, we want to encourage you, get it, <laughs> get a copy. You can get the audio book and hear the full thing like we heard today on the podcast or the, or the uh, hard copy and tell your friends— we, we want a revolution of restoration. Yes. And it's out June 7th. Order it now and you'll have it on June 7th. Yeah. And we right. can't wait to stay on this journey over the next several weeks with you. 